Welcome back everyone to our first seminar of 2020. It's a real pleasure to introduce Dr. Bonner Newman today. So Bonner Newman is a program manager at ECN in the Netherlands. I think she's known to many of us. She's done extensive work in crystalline silicon photovoltaics. Today she's going to talk to us about the work she's been doing in photovoltaics and transport. So we're really excited to welcome Bonner to UNSW. She's being sponsored on the Women in Engineering program. So Bonner, it's a real pleasure having you here. I'm really grateful you were able to come. Just say a little bit about Bonner's background. So she did her PhD at MIT, carried on to work in Silicon Valley at, uh, uh, in photovoltaics companies, Twin Creeks company being one of them. And then she moved on to ECN where she now works. So Bonner, thank you so much for coming and we're really looking forward to your seminar. Thank you, Ned. And thanks everyone for being here today. Um, as Ned mentioned, uh, I, in the last two or three years, uh, we've become very involved, um, especially in the Netherlands, working on vehicle integrated PV and integrating PV into our transport sector. Um, and the reason for this is because if you have, uh, if you look at the most recent uh, updates about the growth of electric vehicles globally, um, you can see that there are now just over 5 million electric vehicles globally, and this is, this is a curve that is increasing exponentially. So what this means is that a huge part of our transportation sector, which accounts for approximately 25% of global CO2 emissions, is converting from internal combustion engines to the electric side of, and, and then going to be dependent on the grid. And this is great in terms of CO2 emissions, except that in order to actually make them really emission-free vehicles and decrease the CO2 impact, you have to actually make sure that all of that extra power that is being now transferred to the grid is going to be generated by sustainable energies. So, of course, solar, wind, other sorts of sustainable energies, and the portion on the grid is increasing, but that doesn't mean that it has actually, the, the, most of these vehicles, that we currently have enough PV installed in order to support these vehicles with emission-free energy. So in the Netherlands, in particular, when it comes to electric vehicles, we face a very large problem because actually we have a huge number of electric vehicles that are being adopted. Um, as of about a month ago, that we were reporting that there were 173,000 uh, electric vehicles uh, now in the Netherlands, registered in the Netherlands. This is in a country of 17 million people. So you can see this is that we're, we're actually one of the largest adopters of electric vehicles globally. Um, and uh, which is, you know, a great move. But of course, as I mentioned, we have to support this with sustainable energy uh, on the grid in order to power it. Um, and of course, we also, one of the reasons that we've been able to adopt EVs at the level that we have is because the government has made huge infrastructure investments as well as private industry investments um, in order to make sure that there are grid points to connect your, your EV and to charge it. But of course, this isn't the case for everybody. And if you think about automotive in the past, the dr part of the dream of automotive and part of the reason the vehicle, the, person or the personal passenger car has been so uh, successful is because it doesn't have limitations. You have the open road, the Route 66 of the United States. I'm assuming there's an equivalent here in, in Australia as well. <laughs> but <laughs> this picture changes a bit when you start putting in your electric charge points. On a personal note, yesterday, Ned took us down to Canberra uh, in the UNSW Tesla. It was a great trip. We drove down there, we stopped, and stopped at a supercharger, had some lunch, drove all the way down to our visit there, had our visit, jumped in the car to drive back, and we put in our coordinates and coming back to the uni. And it said when we arrived back at the uni, in order to make sure that we had about 15 to 20% power left in the battery, we needed to stop again partway back and charge for 10 minutes. That would have been a great time to have solar on the car because that would have been just enough power and charging in order to make sure that we didn't have to stop on the way back. So, as I mentioned, in the Netherlands, this is in Australia, and in Australia we would have had plenty of sun, even yesterday with some of the cloud cover, that we would have been able to charge the car on the way back as we were driving it if it had solar on top. But uh, in the Netherlands, we don't have quite so much sun, but we're still very interested in this topic. 
Part of that is because we have a large group of students, uh, as many of you probably know, that come down here every two years to compete in the World Solar Challenge. And they've done incredibly well with this over the last few years. So we have a whole group of people that are quite interested in this topic. Um, and so these are just the results from the most recent, uh, from just in October this year of 2019, of last year, 2019, um, where we had three teams uh, of students competing in the Challenger class and one team competing in the Cruiser class. So at TNO, we're very fortunate when it comes to addressing this problem and thinking about it, um, that we have uh, both a unit that is focused on solar energy, which is the unit that I work in. And in addition, we also have a unit that's focused on traffic and transport. And in this traffic and transport unit, there's a group that works on powertrains for electric vehicles. There's a group that collects data about how vehicles are used in the Netherlands and abroad. And also how, the, how these vehicles actually use energy and, uh, and, and how we can make them more efficient. So we've been able to combine these two to really make some pretty significant uh, headway into this problem of uh, vehicle integrated PV, both on the design side, but also on the understanding side of where, of where PV can play the best role in the transportation sector. So in the solar energy unit, we have the experience uh, stemming across the entire value chain from raw materials all the way through module systems and applications. Um, and then we've combined this with our automotive research, as I mentioned, where they are working on all the different aspects of powertrains, uh, patterning, traffic flow, and making things much more efficient. And in addition to ourselves, we also are very fortunate to have a, t a, gr a company that has come out of the solar team Eindhoven from the World Solar Challenge called Lightyear in the Netherlands. And their aim is to create one of the world's first commercial solar vehicles. Um, so that is the car here shown on the left. This is actually their prototype car that we've worked with them uh, to help work on the, the solar technology for it. And then I don't want to uh, not mention, of course, Sono Motors, which is a German company which also is working on this problem um, and has created the Scion, which you see here on the right. Um, I think it, as an, uh, another little aside, um, Sono Motors recently ran, ran a crowdfunding campaign um, in order to help finance their further developments. And they challenged their supporters to raise 50 million euro in 50 days, starting on December 1st, 2019. As of yesterday, I checked, and they, they have now raised just under 54 million euro. So this is, a, this is a real thing. There are people out there that really do want this. Um, I hope I can convince you by the end of today that it's not just a gimmick, but that we are now solar technology is at a point where we really can make a contribution, and really the advantages of this will only grow in the future. So. Why hasn't this do been done before? Well, there's a number of reasons. Um, and this is actually Lightyear's uh, story, part of Lightyear's story. And it's because there's two things that have to happen. The first one is that we have to make solar, we have to adapt the solar and integrate it into the car, and it needs to be done at a reasonable cost. And so fortunately, at this point, crystalline silicon solar is high enough efficiency and low enough cost that we think we can achieve this. But in order to really make a contribution to the, prof to the energy use of the car or the energy profile of the car, the car also has to be improved in terms of efficiency. So Lightyear as a company is working on both of these aspects. They've come up with a, number of, a fair amount of IP uh, and developments in order to make electric, their electric vehicle, they've, they're designing it from the ground up, and to make their electric vehicle the most efficient electric vehicle on the market. And then with that coupled to some of the innovations in solar, the goal is to be able to power uh, on a very nice sunny day to be able to essentially power the vehicle more than 50% from the solar produced on the roof of the car. And by that, that is the definition they are using of what a solar electric vehicle actually is. But um, when we look at the, sol at the PV part, uh, a number of technical challenges here that we have to address. Um, the first is, of course, that we need to get as much PV on the car as we can, and it, uh, especially on the sun-facing areas. And on a normal vehicle, that's limited to about five square meters. Um, so, uh, and actually, I shouldn't even say a normal vehicle, but on this vehicle 
that you want to design for this purpose. You want to make that about five square meters. Beyond that, it starts to be kind of too big of a car, I think, for most people's, uh, uh, what most people like. Um, so it needs to be high efficiency. Um, it also has to fit on a curved surface. And this is not just a simple curved surface in one dimension, but actually curved surface in uh, two dimensions or two directions of curvature. Um, and it also has to be designed with the idea that a cell on one corner of the, of the roof or on the hood will see a different sort type of illumination, a different intensity of illumination than a cell on the other side, or even actually a cell one meter away from it on the same surface. So you really have to think about how you're going to deal with these mismatch factors in order to not decrease, uh, which will be continuously there, in order to get the best performance out of the overall system. It also needs to be packaged in a lightweight manner because, of course, every uh, kilogram that you add to the car is going to decrease its efficiency or increase the energy that it needs to use in order to move forward. Um, you, of course, have to worry a lot about aerodynamics because of the drag coefficient and aesthetics, which becomes because people really care what their car looks like. It turns out that's, in most cases, a much larger impact uh, on the the price that people are willing to pay or the car they will choose than almost any other factor. Um, of course, there's also uh, things that we have to think about when it comes to the materials and the coatings and the layout that we're going to use and how we're going to adapt conventional PV to work there. And then you run into the new constraints and new requirements that you have when it comes to reliability and safety. So in the case of reliability, we've probably all heard that transportation of conventional PV modules is a place where things break oftentimes and you have to be make sure that it's sturdy enough to be transported. Well now imagine you're taking your module and the only thing it ever does is be transported. So for 10 to 15 years the lifetime of the car you need this thing to stay robust. So you have to provide it the nice structure that it needs and uh, but also in a lightweight package with all these other um, qualities. In addition it will also see high winds and of course uh, speed and, and therefore high speed uh, collisions and impact from say road debris and little rocks. We've probably all had the situation where we've seen a rock hit our windshield and see a, a nice spider uh, uh, sp uh, crack spread out from that point. So we have to take all of that into consideration as we're developing this. Um, and last but definitely not least is safety. The number one thing in any vehicle construction is that you have to start thinking about safety from the very, very beginning of your design. You have to actually document it in most cases all the way through the manufacturing process of how you're taking into account any sort of potential safety issues and then prove it to the registration authorities at the end. So I'll talk a little bit about how, what that really looks like in this design. Um, so based on some of these constraints, we've decided to use the uh, conductive back uh, contact foil technology that has been designed by TNO um, historically. And this is essentially a, uh, a method where we can do a single step lamination process where we layer a rear interconnection foil that's printed. Then on top of that, we can print conductive adhesive or low temperature solder. Then we place an all back contact cell on top of that and then another layer of encapsulant, and then a glass or protective layer on the front side. Um, this is nice because it allows us to do uh, different types of patterning. It's somewhat like a printed circuit board, and it allows us to do adaptive manufacturing for this, this application. So if you th this is what it would look like for a standard uh, conventional PV uh, module, so somewhat more flat plate, and you have your layers that are built up and you have your full size cell that you're going to pick in place and put on top. In the case of uh, vehicle integrated PV, um, we can use this to make relatively high throughput um, and highly automated uh, back contact uh, modules and adapt it. We can use IBC cells or MWT cells on top. This of course uh, means that we also have access to all different types of cell technology. So diffused or Topcon and header junction cells. Um, in this case, because of the efficiencies that are available at this moment, we are using mostly sun power IBC cells. Um, and it's a low temperature process. So on top of that, we also have another technology that we've developed that we're coupling to it in order to address some of the issues of vehicle integrated PV. 
And this is what we call tessera. Um, and the idea here is that by using smaller pieces of cells, um, and you can reduce, you can basically tune the voltage and current output and cluster cells together into groups that are going to see more uniform groups of, of irradiance. Um, and so by doing that, you're able to actually better control the output of the overall system and deal with issues of mismatch. So in a conventional system, we've been able to use this to, to get much improved shade linearity. Um, and in the automotive system, we're able to then apply this in such a way that we can, we can reduce the power electronics that we need for the overall system and still maintain very high levels. Um, where our goal is over 95% kind of uh, overall utility of the, the PV that's on the roof at any one time. So we've taken some of these ideas and we, we had used them before on, very, on flat plate uh, solar on PV modules, but now we needed to take them and put them into a package that can curve. Um, and so um, in order to, to do that, we, we started doing experiments with, with a number of different material stacks and so choices of uh, foil designs and encapsulants and front materials and rear materials. And we were able to take a, this, in this case, we've actually looking at full size cells, six inch cells, a little mini module, and putting them into this stack. We, you can see here on the left, we have an EL image before uh, that was made after lamination in flat. We, then we took that flat but flexible module, wrapped it around this tube that you can see here on the right. It has a, radi a radius of curvature of 12.5 centimeters. And then this is the EL image after curvature. Oops, sorry. Um, this is the EL image after curvature. So you see that we were able to essentially wrap this around the, the cylinder of quite narrow radius and not actually induce any kind of extra cracking in the crystalline silicon cells. Um, we did see a slight drop in the relative efficiency, um, but it, it didn't seem to correlate directly to a contact problem or something else. It, it could potentially be within kind of the noise of, of our measurements for these mini modules. In addition to all of that, uh, we also have some technology that we developed at Tino and in Holland that is uh, a way to make PV modules aesthetic, and so it's a print that we can introduce into this, this whole stack of material that allows us to come out to make the modules look uh, kind of with any color or design on top of it. So we're also integrating this into our system, um, and the, one of the advantages of the, to this technology is that we're able to do, with this added foil, we're able to get slightly better than linear uh, performance as compared to the coverage that we use. So Essentially, if you want to have a really, really blue car, we can potentially use this technology to make the roof look a, a nice quality of blue. Um, but instead of losing, if, if the coverage that's needed for that is approximately 50%, instead of losing 50%, we'll lose about 35% of the performance. Now, of course, that's not exactly where, that's not where we're aiming for right now. Mostly we're focusing on black cars, because that's the easiest. <laughs> um, but this is a potential application in the future or a way that we can make uh, we can improve the aesthetic of the vehicles in the future. So using all of that and combining it together, we've actually made our first uh, full-size car roof, actually almost a year ago now. Um, and this car roof, we were able to put crystalline silicon cells in that were covered 90% of this area, um, of the full area of the roof. Um, so. And in that, of that area, we were able to maintain 19%, greater than 19% efficiency um, measured in STC uh, conditions. So this is a little bit of a, we have to actually correct for this because of course in our STC uh, flash tester, this is a roof that's approximately 1.8 meters by about 1.3 meters and it has curvature to it. So because of that, the front and the back and the sides have end up receiving less irradiance and illumination than the center of the module, which we've lined up in our normal plane. So um, once we correct for that, we think we could, we're getting something closer to probably 19 and a half percent active area efficiency. Um, and this corresponds then to a total area uh, cell to module performance of better than 86 percent, which we're pretty happy with for our first prototype. Um, in addition to that, we were able to take the technology that we developed, or I should say Lightyear was able to take the technology we developed, and you can see here on the picture on the right, they were able to integrate that into their first prototype vehicle called the P-Zero. 
And this is a close-up of this module actually on the car and on the car body. And here you can see this, this car sitting on the streets in San Francisco uh, on its, its way on a world tour road, a world tour road trip. So um, it's, it's in the car and functioning. And uh, you, if, if it comes to a place near you, you can go check it all out. Or if you come to Europe, I can, I, I can help you come see it in the Netherlands. Of course, crystalline silicon will get us to a certain point. But in the future, of course, we also need to think about what would be the next step and how to get even more efficiency. And at know, we are also working on perovskite silicon tandems, which we view as potentially one of the next ways to increase the efficiency. If we deal with a lot of these issues and the design problems we, sh we have with the crystalline silicon and we can get that embedded into the car safely and effectively, the next step would be to potentially add something like a perovskite or other thin film material on top of that in order to get more performance out of the system. Um, but as I mentioned before, we have to do all that, and that's the design, and that's what it looks like, but we also have to make sure that it's going to last a long time and that it's going to be safe. And in automotive, there's a lot more requirements for all of that. So you have to make sure that it's it's crass, it, it's, it will re resist crash and functional safety testing. Um, so you, you've all probably seen the crash test dummy videos. Um, I'll show one in a second as well where uh, you know you need but because you're integrating this PV onto the body of the car you in particular have to pay attention to pedestrian safety so if you imagine uh, probably most of you saw the Tesla truck re um, unveiling where they took they did essentially a ball drop test um, on the side of the window of the truck and Elon Musk had someone throw a uh, no I guess actually use a sledgehammer or throw a ball into the, the steel ball into the window and it cracked, which was not what he was expecting, but it didn't go through, which is what he pointed at, and that's actually what the safety test requires in most of our ball drop tests. However, the other issue is that for, say, if you're going to put PV on the hood of a car, you also have to pay attention to whether or not the, the say, someone's head that bounces off of this does not have to absorb too much in the way of impact. In addition, you also have to make sure that it's going to survive vibration and shock testing that the car will go through, um, and accelerated uh, temperature testing, which actually has much higher temperature envelopes uh, than what we use in typical PV. So for example, uh, the thermal cycle test for automotive goes up to 110 degrees C rather than just 85 degrees C. So um, and if you want to think about the hood, it's a nice uh, case. As I mentioned before, you have to pay attention to what would happen if this car impacts a pedestrian and what that would be. Um, and this car, the hood also, of course, has to have very high global stiffness because it needs to not bend too much as you're driving and go around corners. It needs to have a good dynamic stiffness so that the vibrations are not too much, uh, not just for the actual PV, but also for the passengers in the car. Um, and then you need to know how it's going to deform and, and reduce in the case of a frontal collision. So here's a video. Let's see. Yeah. Oh. Um, that I actually just pulled off YouTube of this, of what's done for this pedestrian safety test. So what's actually done is that you take a head, like uh, impact element, and you have to test it on approximately 25 spots on the hood of the car to see what will happen and what the impact on that element will be. If it's, and it's basically shot at the car from above at approximately 40 kilometers per hour. So you can see here, this is a slow motion video of just a normal car doing this in a normal hood. And you'll see that when it hits, you have to have an incredible amount of deflection that occurs. Uh, in order to, to pass this test and to have the impact be low enough. And so therefore, actually integrating this into a PV module that will also survive the vibrations and everything else is actually quite, uh, will, will prove to be quite a mechanical challenge, I think. Um, and we're undergoing that sort of testing now to see where we stand on things and what, what sort of developments we need to continue with. Let's see. Um, so in addition to all of those sort of design considerations and safety considerations, um, we are also working with the International Energy Agency PVPS Task 17, which is about integrating PV with mobility. 
And what there, what we'd like to do is we're taking a much bigger approach to thinking about how PV can be integrated with uh, tr the transport sector and what the actual benefits are and why it is that people really want to, would want to buy this or have it in their um, vehicles. So uh, benefits, of course, include the CO2 reduction, um, range extension and reducing anxiety, range anxiety, and the economic benefit. And so we've created uh, an energy flow model uh, at TNO in order to look at these, all of these different aspects and actually quantify them so that we can try to understand better how we can optimize the whole uh, package in order to be more effective and more interesting for customers. Um, so this is a schematic of our energy flow diagram and we bring in uh, the car energy demand model, we bring in battery and charging um, a model that has been created by our colleagues at TNO Automotive. We have our solar yield model, which is something that we have done at TNO uh, Solar Energy. And then we also need data about uh, location and irradiance, which is one of the things that brings me to visiting uh, UNSW this month. Um, and the group of Ned and Yvonne and Jessica who are working on creating a device that actually we can put on a car and measure this in real time. And then from that, taking in all of those inputs, we are calculating what we are calling the number of charging moments that you would have. So that's one of the things we're using to quantify this is if you have to charge your car, well, for example, on your way to Canberra and back twice, um, then by having solar on there, can you reduce that to once or maybe never in the right situation? Of course, we can also look at the savings in terms of CO2 and the economic savings. So in our initial case studies, we are simply assuming actually that we have about 750 watts on the car that's that the solar we've put on the car is capable of doing this in the future we will integrate in the more detailed uh, d model of our of our PV module that we've made um, and uh, we do put in all of the we, we have to address the questions about how many kilometers a car will drive so the model of the driver profile we call it um, the car efficiency in this case most of these cases we're using a Nissan Leaf which is one of the most uh, energy efficient electric vehicles on the market um, and then also we can add in comfort control. So if you want to run the air conditioning or if you um, want to have your radio and plug in your computer while you're, you're driving along, any of those sort of things that also will use some of your power. Um, we also take into, of course, the, the battery performance, the capacity and the efficiency of the charge controller and then how you would actually do your charging. Um, and so in this case, we've just assumed a fixed slow rate because that's actually the most common way of charging for most EVs at this point. So this is an example of a driving profile. Uh, it's a commuter profile where you mostly just commute 20 kilometers uh, to and from work uh, every day. Um, you do this about five days a week. And then of course you have a holiday where maybe you use your car a bit more um, and you're driving it on variable road types. Um, so, you know, smoother drive, uh, smoother roads versus more rough roads, et cetera. Um, and so it comes out to about just over 11,000 kilometers per year. And in this case, we are thinking about it in the Netherlands because that's where we have the most data. Um, but we have actually done this simulation assuming some other locations as well. And if you look at the benefit summary, this is a table where uh, we, we try to quantify what is possible with this just 750 watts of PV. Um, the first we can look at what the energy demand is of the car without the PV or just in general uh, and that's in Maastricht which is in the southern part of the Netherlands, Madrid in Spain and Stockholm in Sweden. Um, and you can see here in the second column or the third column the potential PV generation as a uh, percentage of the energy demanded by the vehicle. So you can see that even in Sweden and the Netherlands in the far north we can actually do more than, almost more than 50% of the, the um, needed energy demand for this very simple uh, driver profile. Um, what that means in terms of charging moments is that we can reduce the charging moments by more than 50% in most cases because of the time situation of when you would need to charge based on how far you're driving and, and where, you, where you need to stop. Um, when you look at the economic benefit, it's in some ways, I guess, less significant um, in the sense that it's you know, on the order of a couple hundred euro per year. Um, but if over the lifetime of a car, that's two or 3,000 uh, euro that you would be saving. 
and the CO2, uh, the savings in CO2 equivalents from, uh, if we assume that we're using kind of the global average uh, CO2 um, uh, grid consumption factor. Um, of course, in places like Sweden, there you actually would save less CO2 because they have a, uh, a much more hydro on the, s on the grid. And in a place such as Australia, you might see a much better savings in terms of CO2. Um, I mentioned the charging moments, and this is actually how, this is the outcome on the model and in terms of what we really do model uh, and see. So on this plot here, on the top part, we have what, the, what everything looks like in terms of charging and discharging during a drive uh, without the PV and on the bottom with the PV. And, in, the, and in, in this top plot, or in both plots, the red circles represent moments that we attach to the grid to charge. Um, and then all of the other things are essentially the charge and discharge state of the battery. And the yellow represents times that we take a drive and deplete part of our battery. Um, and then the blue, of course, in the top plot, it's, it's flat. But in the bottom part, you can see how we actually are generating PV throughout the year. Um, and so what you can see is there's a few takeaways. Is that, first of all, of course, we actually can generate, this is in the Netherlands in this case, we can generate P some amount of PV throughout the year. This is because in a lot of cases for this sort of driver profile, the car during the day is just sitting in a parking lot in the sun, we assume. Um, and most significantly is that if you look at the red circles, there's quite a few less if you look down on the plot on the bottom. As a matter of fact, over the year, you can go from having 59 grid charges so that's approximately a little bit more than one per week, down to 33 uh, grid charging moments. Um, so it's uh, yeah, almost a 60% a, a decrease in your charging moments. Um, and what's even more significant in my mind is the fact that if you look here in the summertime, there's actually a period of time of about three or four months where you don't actually have to plug your car in at all. And that's even in the Netherlands, which we don't have as much sun. So if you're thinking about your lifestyle and, and buying an electric vehicle, say you don't have the ability to put an electric charging point right outside your house, the fact that for a few months in the summertime, you don't actually have to worry about it, at least for me, that starts to make me think that this isn't such a bad idea. So we want to validate all of this. Uh, we've just put in a bunch of assumptions now, but we're in the process of validating it. Um, we've actually built a, a very beefy vehicle irradiance test setup that you can see here that we're using. We, we can't put this on very many cars, but we're using it to collect our first set of data. So what you see here is that in the center is a big PV module. I promise this is not what Lightyear is making as their manufacturable car. <laughs> um, this is a big PV module, and it's actually used to power, to charge the battery for this system. So it's not actually used for the irradiance measurement. But in the four corners, we have reference cells set up, and we attach this to a roof rack on the car. Um, and then from that, we're able to collect data. Um, in this case, we've put on, we've, we've somewhat over-engineered it. We have a collection a rate of 100 hertz. Um, and so we can collect data like you see here, because we're also collecting uh, GPS data. So we can see here, this is a kind of a commute to uh, work. Here's, our, here's the car when it's driving on this, and the velocity, you can see that it's, and then here in the middle of the day, from nine until six, this person worked a good long day. Um, then the car is just sitting parked. Here's the irradiance profile, and the specific reason I pulled out this day is because what you can see here is that the green line here is actually the uh, weather data locally that we, we can map. Um, and what we saw here is we said, huh, that's a very strange day because we're seeing a lot less uh, irradiance than we would expect from the KNMI, the weather data. And when we went and looked at the GPS data, we realized that the car was parked in the shadow of a really big building. So uh, we, we want to understand this sort of behavior and how people will actually use their vehicles and park in certain situations. So we're hoping that we can use this to understand, you know, what maybe our best practices or, and or what is really the real life expected uh, performance of these uh, vehicles. And then we're also measuring the temperature of our modules in order to, to calibrate performance. Um, another really interesting thing that we can do with some of this data as you can see here that we saw in this curve, there were these two dips very close together uh, that we, in the irradiance profile, while the car was still traveling at a very constant speed. So we again zoomed into the GPS data, and there's this roundabout here, 
uh, which is actually a raised roundabout. And so the car actually was, tr was going through this and it, uh, it goes under one overpass and then out in the sunshine again and then under another overpass. And we have a video of that here because we have the four radiant sensors on the corner of the car. And so here we can use, we can actually see the way that the different sensors are seeing different amounts of illumination at the same time. Um, and so our hope is to expand the study to be able to look at the impact of this dynamic radiance on our overall system and, and simulate it into our uh, um, solar irradiance um, model to take that into account as well. So I hope I've been able to somewhat convince you that uh, solar EVs are, are a reality and they are uh, possible now with the current uh, PV technologies. And I think in the future they'll become even more possible as we increase the efficiencies and, and the work that's done to make um, uh, better overall performance and lower cost uh, PV for everybody. The safety and the reliability are really significant challenges for VIPV and this is something that we don't always start with in our design process when we're thinking about how to make new technologies for PV, but it's something that if we want to address this market then we, we definitely need to uh, start taking into account. And uh, with enough data collection, we're hoping that we can actually make pretty significant and, and reasonable predictions and understand quite a bit more about how mobile PV will function and perform. Uh, so I'd like to leave you with just the fact that really when we think about whether or not PV on a vehicle will work, it really does uh, give us more independence from the grid, which is something that I think a lot of people really do want in their personal transportation uh, situations. And it frees up the government from having to make huge infrastructure investments. So it makes it, this also becomes a technology that is distributed that people in many different countries in many different situations could potentially take advantage of in the future. And of course, truly sustainable transport. So not just electric transport that we've switched the burden to the grid to make it CO2 free, but really it allows you as a consumer to choose to have truly sustainable and CO2 free transport. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bonner. That was a fantastic talk. And I think if there was a take-home message, one of the take-home messages from our road trip yesterday was we covered 600 kilometers in the electric vehicle in 14 hours. So, you know, three hours to Canberra, three hours back. I think there's a battle of endurance here. I mean, the Tesla, is the Tesla stronger than the driver? <laughs> and, you know, the Tesla needed one and a bit charges. I think we need a solar method for charging Ned. I think <laughs> it's called coffee. Well, yes, uh, there's <laughs> lots of coffee. So thank you, and we've got plenty of time for questions, so open up to all for questions. Alistair, thanks. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Bonner. Very interesting talk. Just, I've got a lot of questions, but I'll catch up with you another time because I've got to run away. Just a, a question about um, thermal management within the vehicle. Mm -hmm. um, I guess for a car like this, you're going to be wanting to park in the sun. Um, and I'm thinking in an Australian summer with you know, 30, 40 degree heat, lots of sunshine. Uh, you want to park the car in the sun. I guess window um, windscreens in Europe are heat rejecting. Mm -hmm. In Australia, we don't have such sensible things. Oh, okay. Um, Good to know. Yeah, uh, we should. Um, but I'm just wondering about how you deal with heat getting into the compartment of the, the car. If you're parked in the sun in an Australian summer, I'm thinking, hmm, it's going to be a warm car when I come back. Yes, yes, it is going to be a warm car when you come back. Um, there's actually a few different ideas that have been bounced around about this. And, and um, with respect to the car itself, I can't really address what Lightyear is going to choose to do. But when we've thought about it um, in our own thoughts about things, we've, we've, you know, there's the possibility that you can use the, the power that's coming from the PV module in order to actually do some sort of active cooling of the car. Um, so that's one thing, especially if you get to the point where you're full their battery is full, because right. of course you don't want to overcharge it, you have to do something with that power anyhow. Um, and that would be a pretty simple solution to kind of, to directly pump that into some sort of situation where, you know, maybe the windows roll down a little bit and you turn on a fan and start cooling the system. Um, but then, you know, there, there's also, uh, if you're re-engineering the car from the ground up to really make this match, you can also do things like put in much better thermal uh, glass yeah. for your windows, for or example. Yeah, you can insulate the roof. So I think it's more a little bit on the car design side to address that. But 
Um, my understanding is that there are technologies out there now that we can imagine that could really address a lot of that. Um, but it will be something that if you're going to always park your car in the sunshine, yeah, um, that's not going to be, you, you will come back to a pretty warm car if you don't do something about it. Thank you for this nice talk. I have three questions. The first one, do you, did you mention that for your measuring of efficiency, you have problems because of the curvature. Mm -hmm. What is your uh, strategy to attack that? Do you modify the, the flasher or how this measurement is done? Yeah, so um, we haven't modified the flasher. At this point, what we're doing is applying um, a correction factor because we know pretty well what our air radiance profile is. Um, so we're applying a bit of a correction factor to, to try to adjust for it. But I think the real solution is that we need to do like a flash test inside to get some idea of, of how like one roof will kind of um, perform compared to another roof. But then in terms of understanding how it will actually perform in the vehicle, we really just have to put it, have to put it outside and see what it does in um, outdoor measurements. Um, so that's actually something that we'll be doing this summer when we have some more sunshine. Um, and, and, and checking to see how well the indoor measurement correlates to the outdoor performance. And that'll also allow us to start doing some more studies about the mismatch of irradiance that, of course, one part of the, the roof will always see as compared to another part of the roof. And someone, something linked to that question, is, I imagine then that if you model, when you calculate it, then you include the curvature in the calculation. Yes. So. In the modeling, at this moment, we left it very simple and said we just are capable of producing 750 watts uh, under one sun conditions. But we do have the capability with our, we have a program called Big Eye, um, where we can actually, we developed it initially for bifacial uh, uh, module um, performance uh, per, uh, prediction. But because it's, a, it's essentially kind of a ray tracing, very detailed optical model, we now actually can apply that to curved PV as well in these different shapes. And so um, that'll be kind of one of the next steps in, in uh, improving these, the uh, performance here, or the, the prediction of performance. Um, putting in the actual model of, how, of what the roof is that we think it would look like with those specific curvatures and the amount of PV we can put on it and, and seeing what those numbers give us in terms of uh, the extended range and charging moments. Uh, two more questions. <laughs> Uh, do you use glass in the roof or is uh, another material as the front uh, uh, cover? Yeah, so there's a few options there. Um, and I think there's a couple different ways people are going. One is to use glass. Um, the issue with glass is that for safety reasons, you have to make sure that one, if the glass is damaged, that the shards of glass are, they, they are, end up being very small or actually not too, you have to, there's a range that you have to reach. Not too large, but also not too small that they can cause um, glass splinters. So it's essentially kind of like um, uh, the, the, um, the glass you use in your windscreen where uh, you, know, you need to make sure that it needs to follow the same sort of break, uh, breaking qualities that you have in your windscreen, that there's not shards of glass going everywhere that can damage somebody if they're near the accident. Um, the, uh, so glass is actually a pretty good idea for many reasons, for mechanical stability and, and um, environmental stability. Um, but it has these safety issues. And then if, you, uh, if, if that's not going to work for some kind of safety issue, then you're also potentially can use what a lot of people are doing is some sort of polymer, oftentimes a polycarbonate, um, because that's something that's being used in a lot of automotive um, windows now and, and hoods and um, uh, roofs, for example. Um, so yeah, I don't know, to be honest, I don't know yet which is the best solution. I think it depends a lot on the other parameters of your design and what you're really aiming for um, in that vehicle. Uh, so in a passenger car, there may be one decision if you wanted to now apply this on, say, a delivery van or on a bus or a truck, you might want to think of another solution as well. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe I'll answer the follow-up. Let's have see. Have you guys taken any steps to model, from a techno-economic point of view, how much a consumer is willing to pay in premium for this? Actually, we have not taken that step. Um, but on Tuesday next week, there will be a presentation by a professor here at um, UNSW 
who has done a very interesting survey of this and has some really great results on that um, that uh, Ned might be able to say more about, but I can't at this moment, so. <laughs> well, the, the follow-up is how yeah. much, like, you know, silicon is efficient, but there are other technologies that are more expensive, but, but more efficient, and potentially would be better technologies for tuning the color. Yeah. Yeah, and I think in the future there probably will be. At this moment, because you're already taking a pretty, if we think about a commercial application right now, um, which is where we're just trying to direct things now to create enough of a market that this is, there is a future in this. Um, if you look at the cost of commercially available, higher efficiency, say thin film uh, materials, um, they're approximately uh, two orders of magnitude more expensive to buy. Um, and we want to depend on a supply chain that is established and easy for a, a company like a startup to actually get these materials. So um, I would say at this moment, it would be very hard to see how there's enough margin. We don't have that big of a margin <laughs> in this system to go from, say, spending 1000 uh, uh to build the roof to 100000 for example, to build the roof. So right now, I would say no, but I hope in the future there will be because I think there's some very good technologies coming up for that. Hey, Ivana, thank you for the talk. Um, so nowadays, the main <coughs> component in terms of weight and cost of the EVs is the battery, if I'm not mistaken. Do you see, when you're coupling PV on an EV, do you think this has the potential to actually reduce the size of the battery or weight of the battery? Or do you see this as a parallel technology that's just going to increase efficiency? Um, yeah, it definitely, actually, I have um, a slide on that, let me. Um, so we have done a little bit of modeling on that in our, um, our uh, predictive model and our um, benefits model. So we did just look at what the difference in charging moments is between, uh, with different battery capacities. Um, so you actually gain, um, more in terms of the charging moments, still if you have a larger battery, so uh, your relative gain is, is improved. But um, if you, you do in some ways have the ability to reduce the size of the battery because um, assuming that you can still, the battery is big enough to deal with your say, your normal commute for example, um, then this would also and still allow you to reduce your charging moments in that situation as well. And, Depending on your use of the vehicle, it may be that that, that uh, and, and say where your charge points are. So for example, if you have a charge point at work but not at home, um, maybe then you don't want to have a smaller battery because you want the ability to, like, to leave from home and go places. But this will make it so that it seems a lot more feasible for you to have a car, an electric vehicle, and drive it to and from work. And you can kind of know that if you plan things badly that you can still get to work and charge. Um, because you don't want to be stranded somewhere. But if you're somebody who you know, kinda has a driveway and a charge point right there in their driveway or something, then maybe you want to reduce the size of the battery to make everything a lot more efficient because you're going to be paying for it off of your own. Maybe you have a, a solar, grid, a solar um, modules on your house and they're sized a certain way, for example, and, and it's a better match. So I think it's a very dynamic answer, but there we can actually kind of delve into some of that using this modeling. So if Maybe that's something to think about in the future. Thank you. Bye. Well, now, thanks for the excellent talk. You know, you know how human beings are not primarily rational? Yes. So there's a lot of data that you've collected, but you also mentioned range anxiety, which I think in Australia, for example, is a very serious issue because Australians think they do a road trip like every week, which is not really the case. But has there been studies on, on whether this technology would significantly improve the uptake of electric vehicles because of that reduction of range anxiety because I think this is probably one of the biggest aspects of this. Um, yeah, so it, it's a very difficult thing to quantify, especially as a physicist, um, <laughs> because I'm not used to asking people those sorts of questions. Um, but actually, I'll, I'll again refer you to some of the work that Ned has been collaborating with uh, another professor here at UNSW. His name again, sorry. Taha Rashidi. Yeah, Taha Rashidi, and he'll be presenting next Tuesday at this uh, PV and mobility event um, here on campus as well. Um, and I think he has a much better 
way to answer that scientifically. Um, my own opinion, and just from talking to people, is that I think that yes, this does have a way to help with range anxiety. I mean, for example, the, the, one, the example I gave you yesterday that we had on our trip to Canberra, um, if we'd had a small PV unit on the car, we really wouldn't have had to stop on our way back. Um, and sure, it was a 10 minute stop, but of course then we went off and you know, bought a little bit of food for snacks on the road and it turned from a 10 minute stop into a 30 minute stop. And um, so I, I do think it has the potential to, to really impact that question. The idea that even if you plan badly and you know that at the very worst, all you have to do is pull off to the side of the road and sit in a sunny spot for a couple hours, maybe that makes it so that you feel a lot more comfortable with taking an electric vehicle into the outback or along a, a long road trip. <laughs> okay, so I've got a few questions. I'll sneak them in. Um, first one is um, you show about carbon fiber. Mm -hmm. So my limited knowledge is carbon fiber is quite brittle and they're good for like raising, raising boats and stuff like that, but not good for uh, passenger. So I'd like to hear your comment on that. And also you talk about slow charging. So wouldn't you be, if it's in solo mode charging, you want it to be as fast as possible? while you're at the sun, you want to take advantage of it. And the third one is about trucks, whether you guys look at, is there any benefit of having PV on long trucks and where they do long distances? <laughs> so, okay, so the first one about the, the composites for the um, body of the car. Mm. Um, yeah, that's actually something I'm not such an expert in, um, but for weight reasons, of course, that's where a lot of people in automotive are thinking of. Um, uh, so it's something that we need to be ready to integrate with. Um, and I would say from the PV design perspective, one of the nice things about uh, glass fiber or carbon fiber structure is the fact that it provides um, a very good place to put PV. Um, so it's actually fairly easy to integrate with um, in our experience during say lamination and all of those steps. Um, but it, uh, there are also a lot of constraints on it when it comes to the body of the car. So I don't know for sure, but from our playing with the Tesla that we drove yesterday, the UNSW Tesla, I'm pretty sure that most of the chassis is a, a poly, uh, carbonate frame, or uh, at least a composite frame. But the hood, I'm pretty sure, is actually still an aluminum hood because of the impact problem. Because uh, if you put carbon up on the front, um, you're really going to have issues of the impact because it doesn't flex very much. So, um, yes, yeah, so there's some safety issues there that have to be addressed. Um, the other nice thing, if you use something like a glass fiber or, well, and it, depending on what sort of composite you choose, it also is going to impact w how you want to build up your module because of the stresses in the system because of uh, thermal um, mismatch and, and that sort of thing. So it is really important, I think, in this field especially to it's it's really a fully integrated element it's not just maybe you can do it but I don't think it will make a very good car if you like make a body and then you just kind of glue a PV panel on a flexible PV panel on top we'll have to see but in my experience so far that seems like a very difficult way to approach the problem um, sorry the charging. charging so yeah actually the charging mode that, the method that we're using it that's specifically for the grid charging um, so for the solar charging, we assume that it actually will charge quickly um, and that whatever is available from the solar panel will be immediately transferred into the, um, into the battery. Yeah, sorry, that um, was maybe not clear. And then for trucks, um, we're just now getting more involved in trucks. Um, we've been fortunate in the Netherlands to have the car company to work with, but there are a few truck companies also that are quite interested. Um, and uh, at this moment, I think the main first use of, a, of the truck, uh, solar on the truck, is more about either um, the in cabin environment and making it more comfortable, and also especially for when um, truck drivers have to just stop um, and pull off to the side of the road since they essentially live in the, in the car, in the truck for the day. Um, in Europe, this is actually especially interesting because on Sundays, uh, trucks are not allowed to drive on most of the highways. And so on a Sunday, if you're driving through Germany or the Netherlands, you'll see all these trucks pulled off into the truck stops because they just have to sit there for that whole day. So um, in those situations, 
the PV can actually play a pretty major role of making sure you don't have to just run your diesel engine in order to make your TV or your microwave, or they have everything inside these trucks, so, um, and have that all running, and the AC. Um, but the other thing is actually for uh, refrigerated compartments, it can play a very big role in offsetting that input as well, because again, pulling that from the, the diesel engine is not that effective. So um, there's a lot of talk about how to use PV, onboard PV, for the last mile delivery um, in for like some sort of uh, smaller transport delivery trucks in a city because those that last mile still things need to stay refrigerated um, and they're going to be kind of driving around all day visiting different stops and, and it can play a big role there. Mm. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, hi, uh, Ian Miguel, thanks very much for your presentation. I've also taken the University Tesla to Canberra and had range anxiety <laughs> issues. And I was quite surprised at the standing consumption of the vehicle. It does have a mode, Alistair raised this issue with cabin comfort. Mm -hmm. And it does have a mode where it, uh, you can set it up so it keeps cabin in a certain temperature range. It just pulls the battery down to do it. And then it's also got battery pack cooling as well. Mm -hmm. And I think your idea of pulling heating and AC specifically into your model is really important. It's very important in Australia given how much energy it takes to air condition a car. But I do wonder if you've got that sort of standing consumption and battery cooling in your model. And if you don't, maybe it's something to add. Yeah, um, I don't know for sure if we're incorporating that in that part of the model. That, as I mentioned, that part of the model has been designed mostly by our, our automotive experts. Um, and so, but it's something I will definitely check on. It was quite infuriating. You'd come back to the car and, it, you know, you'd lost a couple of kilowatt hours. <laughs> it's right. like, where to go? And it was these, uh, it was basically cooling. Yeah. The other thing I was asked, thinking about was uh, this issue of curved surfaces. And part of it, of course, is the insulation that falls on the cells. But the other way, of it, and you sort of flagged it, is the way you're stringing the cells together. And you can imagine this trade-off where... Uh, you'd rather not string too many cells together because they're all going to be in slightly different positions or have different insulation. But obviously, there's power electronics issues as you go down to smaller and smaller cell sizes and try and collect all this power off them. Are you, is your modelling or Big Eye or whatever it is actually exploring that? Um, using Big Eye, we can actually explore that because we can group cells in different ways. Um, uh, and so we haven't actually started doing that yet. Um, we have actually in another project having to do with dynamic and variable shading. Um, when we just were looking at how um, a conventional module behaves as you move, as a shade, a small shade moves across it. So imagine PV in the road, for example, and you have long strings of cells and a truck driving over it. Um, and so we have found in that study that um, your choice of power component is really quite important. Um, and it's actually difficult today to go to module man or to um, uh, the you know the um, optimizer manufacturers or the the inverter manufacturers and tell them or ask them what their characteristic is and what their response time is because there's kind of these resonant uh, t response times where you can actually much more you can exaggerate that shade and so rather than being a shade that lasts for a second the impact of that shade can last much longer. And it depends on how the speed of your, your power components and how they're doing their kind of maximum power point tracking. Um, we haven't yet actually expanded that to this technology, um, but it's something we want to do in the future. Um, and I think it's going to become, I think this issue actually of dynamic shading and these transients, as we integrate PV more and more into our you know, urban infrastructure and we have much less uniform illumination, um, you know, we're not just putting all the, every module right next to each other in the exact same configuration. We're, it'll probably be something that becomes a much bigger area of research. Yeah, it's sort of the next step past module inverters is cell inverters. Or right, it right. And how, yeah, what you do with that and how small you make your groupings of cells or how much you cut your cells or... Um, so, yeah, there's, there's a ton of questions there that I am hoping that we'll get more time to look at in the future. I was wondering, have you looked from a, the economic savings a combination of the solar panels with um, vehicle to grid? Um, and obviously when battery is fully charged, if you can connect it to the grid and sell it, or even if it improves potential times of discharging in the evening because the battery is already full when you get back home. 
Yeah, so um, we are just starting to look into that. To be honest, actually at TNO, we're not focusing on that element of it um, at this moment. But in this uh, International Energy Agency Task 17, the, the second task, we're involved in task one, which is about onboard PV. Um, but task two is really focused on some of these sort of stationary PV solutions. Um, and uh, Angel Reinders, who has, was visiting earlier this year, or last year, and will actually, I believe, come down again this year, she and her group are really looking into this question um, in the, within this task. Um, and so it will be something that will come out when we do put out a white paper from the, or the, the results of the task research um, next year in 2021. There will be some information there, and I hope to see more coming out in the next bit as we do this research and, and continue it. So. Um, yeah, it's a, it, I think there's actually quite a few business opportunities there for companies uh, and, and um, individuals to think about how to maximize their economic return with, between stationary PV and, I mean, once you put PV on a car, now you actually in some ways have a mobile power station too. And there may be some benefit to, par to plugging it in over here and actually feeding back to the grid and then going over there to, if you need to pull power from the grid, to go over there to pull power from the grid. Um, and in the meantime, you're charging or discharging. So I have a very large battery in the sitting. Yeah, so the, yeah, it gets, um, I think you also start to bring in, if you want to start thinking about those models that like thinking about autonomous driving in the future or shared car um, opportunities. I mean, there's, I think we will see a big change in how transportation is used. And so all of these come into play. Um, and I have no idea where it will take us at this point. Okay, well, Bonner, thank you so much. That was a great talk. And we've bombarded you with a ton of questions. Uh, thank you. And uh, we'd like to show our appreciation. Thank you all.